Hi, Grace. Welcome. We're going to sing a couple songs this morning, and I hope you'll join in with us. Let's sing Who You Say I Am. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Yes, his love. Hold on, be strong Remember 
the prints go up as the walls come down All creation, everything that will repeat the sound Oh, children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God His name is Jesus Swing wide, all you heavens Let the praise go up as the walls come Everything with breath, repeat the sound of his children. Clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Good morning, Grace Community Church. I'm Pastor Matt. I'm the youth pastor here at Grace. I have the privilege of working with our teens. Check it out, it's springtime and I'm loving it. But you know who may not be loving it quite as much? Our teenagers. Springtime is beautiful, but springtime can be really stressful for our teens. They've got AP tests, final exams, seasons are coming to a close. It can be a pressure cooker of a time. So this morning, we're gonna stop and we are going to unite our hearts and we are going to lift up a prayer for our teens because here's what's really important to Grace Community Church, our next generation. We want our teens to know how valuable they are to us because they are. Pastor John is gonna talk about this this morning that the world needs a community that is loyal to the values and virtues of Jesus. And the truth is, look, we need the next generation to be loyal to the values and virtues of Jesus. We need the next generation to step up and lead. And look, we love them and they're so important to us. Um, in fact, you, you should know, it's fun to, for you to know that my team, the team of leaders that serve our teens, we were all together a couple weeks ago and we got together and we wrote notes and we sent out cards and our teens in the mail, they got this, this gift that we thought, hey, in a time of stress and pressure, this might just brighten their day, a little bit of whimsy. But anyways, I'm here this morning to lead us in a prayer for our team. So if you would, stop what you're doing, close the extra tab in your browser, and just bring your heart into this prayer for our teens with me. Let's pray. Lord, our prayer this morning is for our teens. May they have the distinct sense that during this season, you are walking with them. May they experience during this time of high stress, unnatural levels of peace and joy. May they know deep in their hearts that their future is in your hands and that their lives are not dependent on their performance on these exams and these tests. Lord, may they trust it May they know it. May they know that you are for them, not against them, that you have plans for them and that your plans for them cannot be stopped. Lord, we ask that you would grant them success and that they'd have fun doing it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Is community vital to success in overcoming our addictions? I think addiction can be conceptualized as the antithesis of community. What happens as we become addicted is that we replace relationships with other people with our drug of choice. There are even some people who say we replace our relationship with God with our drug of choice and that 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 drug becomes a kind of a false worship. I think what's essential to appreciate is that we can get addicted even when we have the perfect community. So we can have the best partner and the best parents and the best kids and the best church, and we can still get addicted because the drugs themselves are addicting and can hijack our reward pathway and then cause us to isolate from all of the wonderful people in our lives. So community and connection is really the opposite of addiction. That means that once we're addicted, in order to come out of that place, we have to turn toward community and make those intimate and healing connections. And I really want to emphasize intimate and healing connections because there are lots of ways we can connect with people today that is basically just another form of a drug. Hey everybody, what Dr. Lemke said today in that interview has all the potential to transform your life and my life in a positive direction. Addiction is the antithesis of community. So if you're in community, that will up your chances significantly of breaking that addiction and staying out of that addiction. What all addiction success stories seem to have in common of those who break free from an addiction and stay free of an addiction is community. Community, community, community is vital. Now, I'd like to read to you from Colossians chapter one. Again, this is written to a church. It's written to a community on how we can experience the life that God created you for, created me for, and it is in community, church. So this is what it says, Colossians one, verse 27. To them God has chosen to make known, not just for a certain group of people, but to make known among the Gentiles, right? All people, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, that means you are reflecting the very character of Christ. And when you reflect the character of Christ, glory. We'll get into that in a minute. Verse 28, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Here's the question. Does God have favorite people? That's the title of today's message. Does God have favorite people? Are there special people to God? That word chosen that I read just a few moments ago is repeated. And I like to tell you this, when they read the word chosen, all kinds of alarm bells went off in their mind, kind of in a good way, because it triggered their thinking because God does have chosen people. Oh yes, Colossians 3.12 says this way, God loves you and has chosen you as his own special people. Everybody, today we're going to talk about a doctrine that is known as predestination, that God has a chosen and a special people. Now, before you turn this off, just hang with me a minute. Hang with me, because this is important, because I know some of us who know what predestination is, or we are aware of this theology, some of us love it and and embrace it. Some of us can't stand it. I brought this up in my community group and oh my goodness, I was not prepared for the raised voices, for the pacing back and forth upset, for the pounding on doors and for people saying, I'm never going to come back to group again. Okay, I wasn't prepared. So people get very emotional about this. In a nutshell, here is what predestination means. And I got this right out of the dictionary just so I could get this kind of global view out of the dictionary. What I didn't get out of a Bible dictionary. I got out of just the general dictionary. Predestination is the biblical doctrine that God, in his sovereignty, chooses certain individuals to be saved. In other words, God has predetermined or predestined some people to go to heaven, and some people, no matter how much they want to go to heaven, they haven't been predetermined, predestined to go to hell. Now, 
for people who are experts in the biblical language of the New Testament and Greek, they will tell you that that word predestined is a very strong word. That's why people have come to believe that God has determined that some people have been created, pre-selected by God to be saved. And what they mean by saved there is to go to heaven. And some people have been created, predetermined, and pre-selected by God to suffer in hell for all eternity. Now, everybody, is that what predestination in the Bible actually means? Okay, check out this verse, 1 Peter 2, 9. Just listen to these words. But you are a chosen people. We all want to be chosen. A royal priesthood. What's that? Priest mediate. You know, they work in the temple where heaven and earth intersect, right? A holy nation. God's special possession. Special. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. That's the whole Egypt thing. And into his wonderful light. Oh my goodness, predestination. I mean, if I'm one of the elect, then that's just great for me. I mean, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> and that's all there is to it. Here's what I hope. I hope that by the time I end this message today, you will be 100% fully on board, fully committed to the biblical message of predestination. That's my hope. Now, give me some time to unpack what it is when the Bible talked about predestination and a chosen people and a special people, what they heard when God said to them, you are my special possession. Now, here's where predestination begins. The choosing of a people. Genesis 18, 19, the story of Abraham. It's an incredible story, Genesis 18, because Abraham is questioning God. Nobody questions God. Nobody in Abraham's day would have the audacity of question. And Abraham, like, repeatedly is questioning God. He's questioning God's justice. But here's what God says about Abraham at the beginning of this phenomenal story. I have chosen him. Him is the Abraham. God speaking. I have chosen him to do what? To teach his family to obey me forever. Catch this and to do what is right and fair, to do what is right. So God says, I've chosen a people because they're going to be teachers of justice and fairness on there. I have chosen him to do it. So a chosen people are a group of people who uphold the character of God by living out God's justice. Now, now let's skip way forward in the story to the story of Exodus, all right? What's going on in this great story? And I'm gonna remind you, Colossians, our theme verse is Colossians 1, 13, I have rescued you from a kingdom of darkness. And that reminds them immediately, they're in the headspace of the Exodus from Egypt. Uh, in so many ways, the kingdom of light is the antithesis of the kingdom of darkness, which is Egypt. Egypt is a bunch of super bad ideas God says um, in the beginning of the story of creation, let there be light. And God is saying, I'm shutting down all these bad ideas of Egypt. So in the ninth plague, God says, let there be darkness. Very clear. God does not like, does not approve of what's happening in Egypt. This idea of light and truth is that God is saying, I am want to bring about justice. Now, many of our major uh, universities in America, they began with this whole idea. You take uh, Yale. The emblem of Yale University is in Hebrew, and it means light and truth. The motto of Columbia University is in Hebrew, and it means this, in your light we see the light. In your light we see the light. God's light is justice. God's light is fairness. Just exactly what God says to Abraham when the word for chosen is very first used for the very first time in the Bible. Now, why the plagues? I mean, this story covers so many things. Jesus, the cross, and the resurrection happened during Passover. Egypt is where the Passover begins. This whole story is immersed in the Egypt story. 
there's 10 plagues. They're really not plagues. Only one of them is a plague. They're really 10 signs, but we like to call them plagues. Okay, but why 10? Why not just one? Why, I mean, if God has the power to take the Israelites out, why, is, why isn't there just one? Well, we're told why there's not one. Exodus 12, 12. I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. Why? I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. God is saying Egypt stands for inequality and injustice, that that's what their gods promote. And I'm going to tear all those gods down who uphold inequality and injustice. See, their gods, to treat somebody with injustice was a God-sanctioned thing. To treat somebody with inequality was a God-sanctioned thing. And God says, I have to tear them down. Now, we see that God kills all the firstborn. And you and I read that today, and we say, that's absolutely terrible. And like, these little children had nothing to do with the injustice. But in their day, the firstborn meant the favorite, that it was okay to treat children or people in a favored way. God has favorites. The Egyptians believed in favorites. That's what it means. And God is rejecting favoritism. Do you think that's a good thing? Because when we read the story, we say, oh, that's so, so, so terrible. But the wisdom of this story is, is God says, no, I don't play favorites. I don't say, hey, these people get to treat, be treated really, really nice, but these Israelites that get to be treated as slaves over here or any other person gets to be treated like slaves. Over here. So God is rejecting that. And then we're told that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And, oh man, I've been in so many discussions about that. That's just totally wrong that God would harden Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh didn't have a chance. Well, the word harden means strengthen. And so what God is doing is he's strengthening Pharaoh so that he can tear down all the terrible ideas. Every one of these gods stands for terrible ideas that promote injustice. Okay, let me put it this way. Um, slavery. We struck down slavery. Okay. Uh, would it be okay if we struck down slavery, but Jim Crow was okay, that that lived on? Okay, this is what's happening here in this story. God's saying, no, I'm not hurting your heart because all of these terrible injustices need to be teared down. Okay, okay. Would it be okay, everybody, if we said... All men should be created equal and should be, should be treated with justice. But all women are lesser than. Would that be okay? We say, no, 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 no. That's, that's terrible. This is Egypt. This is what's happening. God is strengthening Pharaoh's heart so he doesn't give up so that every single one of these terrible gods of injustice and equality can be torn down. That's why there's ten blades. God said, it's not enough to tear down slavery. We've got to tear down Jim Crow. It's not enough to tear down uh, just treating all men equally. we got to tear down the fact that we're treating women without equality. This is what it's about. This is the beauty of the story, everybody. Now, now, I don't know how you were taught this story. I know I wasn't taught this story this way. But this is the way they heard the story. This is what they believed about the story. And over time, we have morphed because of I'm such a sinner. I turn things toward myself. I morphed it into, oh, I'm special and it's okay. And I'm going to heaven and I don't know where you're going to go. And or like, oh, God, how can you harden Pharaoh's heart? That is so terrible. Instead of realizing the reality of what was being presented. And that was tearing down every single one, not just one idea. Not just two, but all 10 ideas about God plays favorites. That's what this story is about, and that's what they heard. How do you feel about a God who plays favorites? Let's put it this way. How do you feel about a family member that plays favorites? That happened in your family? You know what? <laughs> When I was younger, I had a grandparent that played favorites. And here's the crazy thing. I didn't even realize it. So I had a bunch of cousins uh, that were all girls and they pick up on everything. And I was so goofy and so ridiculous that I didn't pick up on this. So they told me one day because one of the female cousins was allowed to sit in the front seat of the car of a grandparent, like the grandparent shoved all the other kids. So it was me, uh, one of the few boys and this big family, right? And then all the female cousins and we're all piled. Like there's four or five of us in the backseat of this little tiny car. And then there was the one favorite getting to sit up 
front in all the glory. You know, I'm like five, six years old. I didn't pay attention. It didn't mean anything to me. But all the girls pull me aside later and says, don't you think it's terrible that this grandparent treats this as the favorite? I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even recognize. It. Oh yeah, that's terrible. How do you feel about that? You think that's okay? You think it's okay that God plays favorites? Is that okay? What is this really all about? The firstborn is the favorite. God is tearing that down. Let me read some. Exodus 9, 16. What is this story all about? But I have raised you up, God speaking to Pharaoh. But I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. And everybody, Egypt is the superpower, the longest reigning superpower our world has ever seen. And in this area of the world where the Bible's being written, they were it. I mean, they're it. They're, so everybody knows. So what happens in Egypt, the whole world's going to find out about. And God's saying, you know what? Egypt, it has nothing to do with Egypt as a country. This is human nature. Human nature turns toward this. And when you got that much power, this is what you do. You mistreat people. And God's saying, that needs to stop. I'm not playing favorites. You're playing favorites. I'm not playing favorites. I'm tearing all this down. So when God says, I'm doing this so that the whole world knows my name, name is character. I'm doing this so that the whole world knows my character. Now, everybody, this is one of the most famous stories on the entire planet and clearly one of the most famous stories in the Bible. It is so, so important because I want everybody to know my character. This is what's happening right here. You know, the, the name Exodus, right? We read it in our Bibles as Exodus. If you open up second book of the Bible is Exodus. But actually the Hebrew name for Exodus is the names, the names, because Exodus is all about names. The famous Exodus chapter three, Moses says to God, what is your name? What is your name? And Moses goes to Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, who is this God? I don't know this God. He asks a question. Moses doesn't have an answer, but God has an answer. God says, Pharaoh, you're going to know my name. That's my character. So the whole world knows my character. Now, everybody, God frees them from Egypt, but God also makes it really clear. He was freeing them for a reason. They were freed from Egypt, but what were they freed for? Check this out. Jeremiah chapter nine. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom. That's intelligence. This is something that Egypt was known for. Three things. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, their intelligence, or the strong boast of their strength, their power, or the rich boast of their riches, their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this. Here's what God says we should boast about. Here's what we should get excited about but that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises, here it comes, kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. Righteousness is being right with God and being right with people. It means treating people rightly, fairly, justly. On earth, on earth, for in these I delight. Now everybody, here's the deal with Egypt. Egypt was fixated on money, strength, and power. That's why when Israelites get out into the desert, it was really easy for God to get them out of Egypt. What was hard for God is to get to Egypt out of Israel. So what are they seen doing? They're bowing down to a golden calf, an animal, nature. Egypt worshiped nature. What is nature? Just nature. Everything's determined. The strong eat the weak. I'm powerful, and so I abuse you. That's what the lion does to all the weaker. That's what the great white shark does in the oceans, right? You eat the strong eight weeks. So everything's determined. Determinism. If we don't believe in God or we just believe in nature, everything is determined and we are just robots. Here's the weird thing about how we look at this biblical doctrine of predestination. It's determinism. So that's what the atheist belief is, or that's what the Egyptian belief is. I'm royalty. I get to abuse you. It's just determined. It's just nature. That's what it means to be the firstborn. I get to do this thing. And God says, no, I don't believe in determinism. I believe in fairness and justice and personal responsibility and choice. 
That's the whole storyline of the Bible. This is what it's all about. And God is saying, I am striking that down. This is what the storyline is. And they are really fixated on the afterlife. That's why we got big, huge pyramids. And what does Jeremiah said? It says, you are to live a life of justice and of righteousness. And if you say you know me and you say you understand me and you're not living here on earth, not in heaven, forget heaven. You're not living righteously and justly here on earth and you don't know me and you haven't understood me because I have called you to live out justice and fairness here on earth. That's what it means to be a chosen people. That's what it means to be a special people. God is calling us to do that. And we are to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ because he's the perfecter of that faith. Faith, what am I loyal to? Everybody, here's where it gets really important. Here's what history shows us. Here's what the Bible shows us. And here's what psychology shows us. Whatever you worship the most, you will worship something. It's called transference. You're going to lift up something higher than anything else. And it's going to shape your life. That's just the way it is. And it can't be argued according to many of these famous psychologists who have written these brilliant people who have studied human nature and have written about it. You will be shaped by something. So shouldn't you be shaped by Jesus Christ? Because there are all these people in the Bible. Mo even Moses, imperfect. Abraham, imperfect. Sarah, imperfect. On and on the list goes. The priest, priest in the temple who were supposed to be living out the justice of God are sexually abusing people in the temple. They're stealing from people. Okay. So Jesus comes along and he does it perfectly. And if we do this, if we bow our knee down to Jesus Christ, we will live out that perfect life of Christ because he embodies the perfect life of justice and truth and righteousness more than anybody else has. And this is why it's so important that we fully embrace his calling upon us. He has predetermined for us to live out his righteousness. And if we bow our knee to him, we have a shot of doing this. This is why Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you is the hope of glory, the hope of glory. And Habakkuk 2.14 says, this is the goal. This is the goal of biblical predestination. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Glory in the Bible means reflecting the character of God. What's the character of God? God told Abraham very clearly to be just, right, and to be fair, to be fair. Look at what Micah 6, 8 says, just in case we're confused about it. He has shown you, O mortal man. So mortal, what does that mean? It means that I'm imperfect. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Now, I love what Amos 5, 21 to 24 says. God says, I hate, wow, strong word, God. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Whoa, what do you mean? You don't like our church services? Your assemblies are a stench to me. Ah, oh, come on now. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring me choice fellowship offerings, I'll have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. What's wrong with us? Okay. Away with the noise of your songs. I'll not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll down like the river, righteousness like a never failing stream. God has predestined us. God has predestined a special people to lay down their lives for others. Everybody, come on. Biblical predestination is not me and my arrogance and pride say, hey, I get to go to heaven, goody, goody. No, biblical predestination is that I say no to my way in deep, deep humility. And I live out justice and fairness and righteousness, even when it costs me everything so that other people can be blessed. It's not about me going to heaven. See how we've inverted this because we have a universal addiction. God has predestined a group, a community. It has to be a community of people to do righteousness and justice. Do you want to be a part of that community? Hey, look, <laughs> nobody's saying, oh, yay, goody, goody. I get to lay down my life so that other people who have not heard about the fact that there's a God of justice can experience a God of justice, can experience a God of love. Now, I want to do one last thing. John 14. I just want to show you how self-absorbed I am, okay? John 14. I read this book as, uh, I read these verses as a kid, and, you know, what my mind went to was amazing. 
John 14, Jesus speaking. And I will do whatever you ask in my name. It's Jesus speaking. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Man, when I heard that verse, I thought of being healthy and wealthy. I thought about having a blank check, winning the lottery and getting everything my way. What's the way of Jesus Christ? It's about getting everything not his way. It's about curbing his own self-will. Oh God, not my will, Jesus said, but thy will be done. It's about laying down his life. Look, glory. Moses goes on the mountain after this great exodus. And he comes down, his face is shining. That's glory. He's all shiny. Jesus goes up on a mountain. It's called the Mount of Transfiguration. And he's all shiny. What's that about? Jesus was about ready to lay down his life for other people. To do the right thing, to do the just thing, to do the caring thing, all that stuff. What does Moses do on the mountain? He says, God... Forgive the Israelites down there who are worshiping the golden calf. I will lay down my life for them. Take me, let me suffer their blame. I'll lay down my life for them. And then all of a sudden he gets all shiny. Biblical predestination, everybody, is not, oh, goody, goody. I'm a special person. I get to go to heaven. And uh, I don't know about the rest of you, you know, tough. No, biblical predestination is this I am curbing my way and laying my life down and I'm suffering. Even if you give me a bunch of injustice, I'm returning justice to you. I'm returning. I'm going to treat you fairly, meekly, kindly, graciously. I'm going to do all that. You spit in my face and I'm going to say, I forgive you. We're going to do the Jesus thing. Oh, okay. That kind of puts a different spin on it. Would our world be a much better place if that was the case? Of course it would. If everybody acted in a loving way when they were treated in an unloving way, our world be a better place. That's God's solution. God says we need a, a people, a chosen people to do the right thing, even when it's hardest and it costs the most. Now let's close by praying this serenity prayer together. God, Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Everyone, please come back and join us next week. We need to talk about power, and that's our subject next week.